Hi everyone, this is Daniel Buchan, and today we'll be going over how to assess a patient's vital signs. As always, before we begin, I want to take a moment to thank Adriana de la Porta, Maria Velasquez, the Anaclario Learning and Assessment Center, and the Introduction to Clinical Medicine faculty, without whom these videos would not be possible. We're going to go over the video in three parts today. In part one, we will discuss how to conduct a general visual inspection of the patient and provide detailed demonstrations of how to measure a patient's heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. In part two, we will show you how to combine everything from part one into a single fluid exam. And in part three, we will go over some special tests for measuring blood pressure. Knowing how to take a good set of vitals is a foundational skill for any healthcare provider, and it is typically one of the first things you will learn as a new health profession student. A patient's vital signs will often play a significant part in directing your differential diagnosis and management plan, and as you progress in your medical education, you will likely come to appreciate that the vital signs are one of the most valuable pieces of information you will obtain when examining a patient. In short, taking a good set of vitals is one of the first things you will learn, but it is also one of the most important. So focus up, and let's get started. Assessing a patient's general appearance and demeanor is the first thing you will do every time you walk into a patient room, and your general assessment can significantly alter how you choose to proceed with a patient. Is the patient in pain or in distress? Do they look sick? Do they seem anxious, depressed, or confused? Asking yourself these questions will quickly become subconscious, but you should practice doing it intentionally when first starting out. After you finish making a mental note of the patient's general appearance, you will begin to assess the patient's vital signs by first measuring the heart rate. However, before we continue, we need to take a quick pause and give a brief disclaimer about pulse palpation. As you will see in the next two clips of the video, measuring the heart rate is done by palpating the radial pulse. When checking a pulse, it is very important that you never palpate a pulse with your thumb. This is because, unlike the other fingers, the thumb has a palpable pulse of its own. If you use your thumb to palpate a pulse, then you will feel your own heartbeats in addition to the beats you are palpating from the patient's pulse. The best way to palpate a pulse is to use your index and middle fingers, and this is what we will show in the rest of the video. To assess the heart rate, begin by palpating the radial pulse, which is located on the underside of the wrist immediately medial to the styloid process of the radius, as shown here. Next, measure the heart rate by palpating the radial pulse and counting the beats for 15 seconds, then multiply the result by 4. If the patient's heart rate is abnormal, then count for a full 60 seconds instead. To measure the respiratory rate, begin by placing your thumb immediately inferior to the patient's clavicle, as shown. With your thumb in this position, you will be able to feel the patient's chest rise with each breath. Count the number of breaths for 30 seconds, then multiply by 2. If the patient's respiratory rate is abnormal, then count for a full 60 seconds instead. Over this next set of clips, we're going to demonstrate how to measure a patient's blood pressure, and we're going to take a brief pause here to preview what you're about to see. The first two clips will show you how to place the blood pressure cuff onto the patient's arm. When you wrap the cuff around the patient's upper arm, you need to make sure that no part of the cuff is wrapped around clothing, and also that the artery index marker is on the inside of the arm, overlying the cleft formed between the biceps and triceps muscles. When attaching the blood pressure cuff, it is also important to use a cuff that is the correct size. The fit should be snug, but not tight. If you use a blood pressure cuff that is too large, then the measured blood pressure will be falsely low. By contrast, if you use a cuff that is too small, then the measured blood pressure will be falsely elevated. Using an appropriately sized cuff, but attaching it too loosely, will also cause the blood pressure to be falsely elevated as well. Now that we've covered how to attach the cuff, we're going to play the next two clips demonstrating what we just discussed. As we begin, notice how the demonstrator makes sure that no clothing gets caught underneath the cuff. Also, notice how they attach the cuff snugly, but not tightly, and make sure the artery index marker is in the correct place. In this clip, we show the artery index marker more closely as it overlies the cleft between the biceps and triceps muscles. Once again, the cuff is attached snugly but not tightly. We'll briefly pause to preview the next two clips you're going to see. In the first clip, we will demonstrate how to hold the patient's arm when measuring the blood pressure, and in the second clip, we'll show you where to palpate the brachial artery. In the first clip, you will see the demonstrator support the weight of the patient's arm by cupping the patient's elbow in his palm. If you're measuring the blood pressure in the patient's right arm, then you will hold the patient's arm with your right hand. If you're measuring the blood pressure in the patient's left arm, then you will hold the patient's arm with your left hand. 
whichever hand you are not using will be used to hold the blood pressure pump. While supporting the patient's arm, you should make sure that the patient's arm is relaxed and that the height of the blood pressure cuff is at the level of the heart. In the second clip, you will see the demonstrator palpate the brachial artery pulse, located over the medial aspect of the antecubital fossa. The location where you palpate the brachial artery pulse is the same location over which you will place the bell of your stethoscope when you measure the blood pressure. Now, we'll hit play, and you can see everything we just talked about. Note here how the demonstrator supports the patient's arm and that the cuff is at the level of the heart. In this next clip, note where the demonstrator palpates the brachial artery. We're nearly done with part one, and we just need to briefly pause here to preview these last three clips. The first clip will show you how to hold the blood pressure pump. It is important for you to note how the demonstrator holds the pump so that he is able to manipulate the tightening knob with only one hand, as this is what you will need to be able to do when measuring the blood pressure. Turning the knob clockwise will close it, enabling you to inflate the cuff, while turning the knob counterclockwise will open it, allowing the cuff to deflate. The more you turn into the open position, the faster the cuff will deflate. In the second clip, we will briefly show you the appearance of a standard pressure gauge. When measuring a blood pressure, we typically inflate the cuff to 180, then begin allowing the cuff to slowly deflate. In the last clip, we will briefly show you what it will look like when you're holding everything at the same time, holding the patient's arm, holding the blood pressure pump, and holding the bell of your stethoscope against the antecubital fossa. Finally, something which we did not explicitly demonstrate, but which is also important during blood pressure measurement, are the positions of the patient's feet and legs. When measuring a blood pressure, the patient should be sitting with their feet flat on the floor, with their legs uncrossed. Now that all that is covered, we will unpause the video and continue to the end of part one. Note here how the demonstrator holds the blood pressure pump so that he is able to manipulate the tightening knob with one hand. It may be helpful to pause. He begins by turning clockwise all the way into the closed position, enabling him to inflate the cuff. After inflating, he turns the knob counterclockwise, which will allow the cuff to deflate. This is a blood pressure gauge. We typically pump up to 180. This is how it looks doing everything at once. We support the arm, we check the brachial pulse, we put the bell of the stethoscope over the brachial pulse, then pick up the pump and prepare to inflate the cuff. Once again, it may be helpful to pause. This concludes part one. In part two, we're going to show you what it looks like when you put together everything from part one into a single fluid exam. The examiner begins by introducing himself and conducting a general assessment of the patient's appearance and demeanor. You can often do this while making light conversation. Once done, he moves on to assessing the patient's heart rate. Notice that he also puts his hand in position for checking the respiratory rate. He'll check the heart rate for 15 seconds, then multiply by four. Then he can immediately move on to checking the respiratory rate for 30 seconds and multiplying by two. The additional advantage of this is that you do not have to notify the patient that you are checking the respiratory rate so they don't change their breathing. Feels a lot longer than you think it does, doesn't it? So, 45 seconds up, now we move on to checking the blood pressure. The doctor selects an appropriately sized cuff, and then makes sure to attach the cuff, not having any clothing in the way, snug but not tight, with the indicator mark in the correct position. With the cuff attached, he holds the patient's arm at the appropriate level, palpates the brachial artery, puts the bell of the stethoscope over where he just palpated the brachial artery, holding it in place with his thumb, picks up the pump, and then inflates to 180. After inflating to 180, he will slowly deflate the cuff. Remember, the systolic blood pressure is where you first start hearing Karakov sounds, and the diastolic blood pressure is when the Karakov sounds disappear. It's not shown here, but the patient's feet are flat on the floor and his legs are not crossed. 
Once done taking the blood pressure, the provider removes the cuff and then ends the exam. And that's a standard vital signs. The first special test we will discuss is blood pressure measurement by pulse obliteration. However, the video clip we have for this test is rather short, so we need to pause here in order to have enough time to explain when to use the special test and how to do it. You should perform this special test if you either A. heard Karotkov sounds immediately at 180 millimeters mercury during your initial blood pressure assessment, or B. if you suspect that the patient may have an auscultatory gap. The concept of the auscultatory gap often confuses new learners, so we will try to briefly explain it here. An auscultatory gap is a phenomenon which may occur in the setting of significant atherosclerotic disease. In patients with an auscultatory gap, the Karotkov sounds disappear during a particular range of blood pressure cuff inflation, and this can result in significant underestimation of the systolic blood pressure. For example, let's say a patient has a true blood pressure of 220 but with an auscultatory gap from 190 to 160, during which the Karotkov sounds disappear. If you were following the standard method of blood pressure measurement, you would inflate the cuff to 180, hear nothing at first because you were within the auscultatory gap, then begin hearing Karotkov sounds at 160. In this way, you would be tricked into falsely thinking that the systolic BP was 160, completely missing the patient's true systolic blood pressure of 220. By utilizing this special test and assessing the blood pressure with the aid of pulse obliteration, we can completely avoid this problem. To perform this special test, place the blood pressure cuff on the patient's arm as you normally would. Next, palpate the radial pulse. While palpating the radial pulse, begin to rapidly inflate the cuff, and continue inflating the cuff until the radial pulse disappears and is no longer palpable. Note the pressure at which the radial pulse disappears, and add 30. Deflate the cuff completely, wait 30 seconds to 1 minute, then retake the blood pressure via the standard method, but this time inflate the cuff to the pulse obliteration pressure plus 30 instead of 180. As you will see in the clip, the actual mechanics of this special test are quite simple. Rather, the difficult part is knowing when to use it. As we unpause the video, you will observe the demonstrator palpating the radial pulse as he inflates the blood pressure cuff. However, in order to save time, we have not shown the demonstrator retaking the blood pressure with the standard method as this would simply be a repeat of what you saw in parts 1 and 2. To perform the special test for orthostatic hypertension, begin by having the patient lay down flat on the exam table in a calm, quiet room and leave them undisturbed for 10 minutes. For obvious reasons, this is not shown. After 10 minutes, return to the room and record the blood pressure while the patient remains in the supine position, as you have been seeing in the video clip thus far. Once this is done, deflate the cuff, but leave it attached. As soon as you've finished recording the supine blood pressure, instruct the patient to stand up. Once the patient is standing, immediately retake the blood pressure within three minutes of having them stand up and record the standing blood pressure. A patient has orthostatic hypotension if they experience a drop in their systolic pressure greater than or equal to 20 or a drop in their diastolic pressure greater than or equal to 10 after standing up. This concludes our demonstration of how to assess a patient's vital signs. In this video, we tried our best to make the content understandable to someone who is just starting out in their medical education, and I hope we have succeeded in that. I suspect that in only a few short weeks or months, you will look back on this video and think that I was being excessive, way too basic, and going into way too much detail. I am genuinely looking forward to that moment, and I hope you are too. That's all for now, so thank you for your time, keep trying your best, and we'll see you in the next video.